Thank you, Danielle. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm sitting in Houston, and um, I don't have control over the slides, so you may hear me uh, making some references so uh, Dr. Sumi can, uh, can keep on track uh, with my, my comments. Um, so this is the uh, 18th on 3D seismic, and seismic data, and on the image is a piece of a seismic cube. Uh, the vertical axis is uh, milliseconds to a travel time. Uh, you can see it starts at the shallowest from 200. So we're not showing the first 200 milliseconds. And then it goes down to 2,000 milliseconds or two seconds of two-way travel time. Uh, north is towards the upper left. South is to the lower right. Uh, closest to the uh, viewer is uh, west. And then further away towards the upper right uh, would be east. So uh, we have a 3D volume or 3D cube of seismic data. Uh, I don't think you have the, um, uh, the slide that talks about uh, conditions of use. So I think you should be on outline. Uh, I'll talk about what, a, what is 3D seismic data, the advantages of 3D seismic data, and then a little bit on planning a 3D seismic survey. So the next slide uh, thus far, uh, in the past, uh, meaning within this uh, series of uh, lectures and exercises, uh, I've been describing the use of 2D seismic data. And with 2D data, we have a series of single lines that have been acquired in the geographic area. Um, we sample the subsurface densely where we have a line, either onshore or offshore, and we have a lot of empty space that we have to interpolate in between. Uh, there would be a single source array and a single line of receivers or a single streamer in uh, the marine uh, setting. The distance between individual lines can vary quite a bit. Uh, it might be a one mile spacing, it might be a few miles spacing, might be 10 miles spacing. Uh, for regional studies, they might be uh, 50 miles spacing. Uh, the two images, the one on the left, I think that's from exercise number three. And the one on the right, I don't remember the exercise number offhand, but uh, that was uh, mapping the top of Latrobe unconformity. So what is 3D seismic data? I've talked a little bit about it. This is the same image that was on the uh, first slide. Uh, a 3D survey is one in which the seismic data is acquired so densely and it's uh, processed uh, as a 3D volume or cube of data. Uh, the modern standard, most 3D surveys have a spacing between traces in each direction of 12 and a half meters. Uh, there are some high density surveys that have a six and a quarter by six and a quarter trace spacing. And uh, some people talk about seismic volumes, some people call uh, them seismic cubes. Um, same thing, just a little different verbiage. The advantages of 3D seismic, um, the dense spatial sampling allows us to utilize true three-dimensional processing technology so that we can greatly improve the images of the subsurface. Uh, perhaps the most uh, important is uh, seismic migration. Uh, we uh, are aware of uh, the subsurface structures and when we start uh, migrating the seismic from where the raw data places it to the true subsurface uh, position, uh, we can do a much better job with three-dimensional seismic data than a series of two-dimensional two lines. It gives us uh, new views of the subsurface. Uh, such I'm as sorry, hold on. Um, I'm hearing that there's something wrong with the way it's presenting um, on my end. So I'm trying to okay. fix that. Um, I'm still on slide four, but for some reason from my end, it's not projecting right. And I honestly don't know how to fix it um, because I can see the whole screen. So um, Wendy is communicating with me about um, how it's looking, <laughs> but right now it's not okay. looking so great. And I am really unsure about how to do that. Um, let me see. Um, if if this looks right now, if someone can chime in and put it in the question box, that would be great. If you can see all of slide four.
Okay, you can see. Okay, perfect. Okay, perfect. Okay, I'm on the slide that in the top in red it says advantages of 3D seismic. Is that where you are? Okay, I'm there now. Okay, so we can utilize the true 3D processing. We can get new views of the subsurface, such as time slices. Uh, that was visible on the first slide. I'll show you some more time slice examples. Uh, we can derive new types of specialized data, and I'll show you an example of that uh, using the coherency attribute. We can employ new three-dimensional interpretation tools, such as auto horizon trackers. Uh, we can define things called geobodies. Uh, those are connected uh, seismic samples in the subsurface that has a certain range of a value. So I might uh, see something that has a very high uh, positive amplitude. And so I could say connect all the uh, samples where the amplitude is uh, 1,843 uh, units or higher. And then uh, I can visualize uh, the data and the interpretation in 3D space. So that's uh, bullet point number six. And the next, uh, oh, I'm sorry, number seven, uh, communicate better with peers, uh, our cohorts, our uh, people uh, at our same level, and also with management, uh, people that uh, are above us in the chain. So the next display, 3D seismic displays. Uh, the first image is a 3D volume. That's the one we've seen uh, twice now. And then I uh, click again and it shows an inline, inline 1500. Uh, this runs roughly north on the left, south on the right. I click again, I see cross line 3300. West is on the left, uh, east is on the right. And then I can slice this uh, volume or cube at uh, 1000 milliseconds and that's the uh, color display, uh, it says time slice 1000. And I see a blue and red uh, band, uh, kind of uh, elliptical in shape. And that's showing me that I have a structure there, uh, either an anticline, which uh, it happens to be in this case, or uh, synclines would show bands, uh, circular or elliptical bands as well. And then I can cut a tra traverse or a zigzag line or a random line. Uh, different software uses different terminology. And so I'm showing traverse A, uh, which uh, is neither an east-west nor a north-south line. Uh, it's a um, user-defined line. It could be a straight line or it could be a zigzag line. If I had uh, three wells and they weren't aligned in a single um, uh, 2D profile, I could uh, have the line uh, go from well A to well B to well C. So the next slide, uh, new types of data. If I have a volume of 3D seismic data, we can do different mathematical operations, starting with the reflection amplitude cube, which is the yellow one on the left that says input. And we can do some sort of mathematical operation and generate a new three-dimensional volume. Uh, so the reflection amplitude of the yellow cube has, uh, uh, let's say, x, y, and two-way travel time, and uh, displays the uh, magnitude of the reflection amplitudes, um, we can do some sort of a frequency filter and get x, y, two-way travel time, and uh, low frequency uh, information. Or the lower path, the, the uh, darker green, we can do a cross-correlation, and we can get what is called a coherency 3D volume. So that would be X, Y, 2A travel time and a cross correlation value sample by sample by sample. So coherency is a new type of data. Uh, the term coherency and the original process is patented by Amico. So other companies, uh, oil and gas companies, as well as software companies do a similar type of cross correlation uh, but they can't call it coherency since that is a trademark. Uh, so sometimes it's called semblance, sometimes it's called similarity, sometimes it's called uh, uh, coherence. Uh, well, no, um, uh, I can't think of uh, another term right now. Um, 
But what we do is we look at uh, two traces or two or more traces um, in, the, in a neighborhood and we'll do a cross correlation. So I have trace 123 and 124 and they look pretty similar. I click and uh, a cross correlation of 0 0.99 appears. I look at the next trace, trace 125. I cross correlate 124 and 125. Uh, cross correlation is 0 0.95. I click again, I see trace 126, I click again, and I get a cross correlation of 0.97. Uh, I click again, I get trace 127, and that's not quite the, the same as 126. Uh, the complex red trough that I see in the center of the correlation window on 126 looks like it's shifted down. Uh, the cross correlation, therefore, is going to be less, uh, maybe 0.64. I click again, I see trace 128 within the correlation window. Uh, they look pretty similar. I get a cross correlation of 0 0.98. Uh, I look at trace 129, a high correlation. Trace 130, a high correlation. And so if I use that uh, complex red trough, it looks like uh, there's a blue line on the uh, left side. I click again, there's a blue line on the right side. I click again and I have a black uh, fault uh, showing some offset of that blue horizon. So one reason we can get a low cross correlation or a relatively low cross correlation number is because the uh, reflectors have been shifted uh, slightly in time uh, because of a fault offset. And so I click again, it says high or large correlations. Uh, not likely to have a fault uh, in between the two traces. I click again, it says low or small correlation. Uh, that is more likely a uh, candidate for the presence of a fault. Uh, I click to the next slide, it says coherency type data, and uh, it says, uh, do you see evidence of a fault? And so we usually, usually almost always uh, show uh, coherency style data uh, in a uh, grayscale. Uh, white and light gray means high correlation and so not likely to be fault offset. The uh, dark gray to black are uh, low correlation, so possible offsets. And if we see uh, black lineations, uh, and I've marked a number of them with a um, purple magenta colored line, those are good candidates for the location of faults. So uh, looking at this slide and the um, um, uh, purpley colored lines, uh, it looks like there's uh, 15 or 20 faults that uh, I see some evidence for. Uh, at the lower part of the time slice, it says 1856 milliseconds. The data are four milliseconds uh, sample, so I can look at 1860, 1864, 1868, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And if it is a uh, fault, uh, these lineations will be somewhat in the same position. If the fault is not perfectly vertical, which is uh, common, uh, those lineations will move slightly uh, in one direction or another, and that would tell me uh, what the dip direction of the fault would be. Uh, the next slide uh, has visualization as the caption. Uh, we can use specialized interpretation software to take advantage of the three-dimensional nature of the data. Uh, we can use uh, these tools, uh, visualization tools, to speed up the interpretation time. Uh, it facilitates our quality control on our horizon mapping and our fault mapping and how horizons and faults intersect. And they are great displays to communicate to our peers and to managers. Uh, I clicked again, and now there's a picture on the left of the top of the Barracuda anticline. The reds are the uh, shallower depths or uh, lower two-way travel times. And I go from uh, red to orange to yellow to green to blue. Uh, there's a little gash of green. That's, the, the, that's one of the faults that are important on top of the structure. Uh, I am showing to the left of the image a little uh, circle with a light uh, source. 
and that's uh, showing where the light is um, uh, displayed from in this visualization package. So it's uh, seeing very nicely the top of the structure. And I click again, there's a similar picture on the right now. The light has been shifted to the north and shining on the um, uh, north flank of the Barracuda anticline. You can see the green fault uh, sticking through it. And at the very left, you can see that there's a big uh, step down. Uh, 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 south is the high side, north is the low side, and that's the position of another series of faults. And uh, there's uh, three or four exploration wells that were drilled on that uh, ridge uh, to the um, uh, northwest corner of the display, the uh, lower left. Uh, next slide, planning a 3D survey. Uh, first, we need to know what the business needs are. Uh, that would define what our imaging objectives are. Uh, here I have targets at 4,500 meters. The subsurface area that I want to have uh, good data for is 8 by 12 kilometers. It's an anticlinal trap. The steepest structural dips are about 8 degrees. I'd like to have 50 meters of uh, resolution, and I might have some other uh, objectives uh, for the 3D survey. And given those objectives, the people that uh, design surveys, uh, they can come up with what the field parameters sh should be, the survey area, the fold, the bin size, the source array, the streamer length, and uh, other uh, parameters that they have to define in order to uh, acquire the date um, to meet those objectives. The next slide uh, says image area and survey area. Uh, the, air, the surface area of the 3D survey depends on several things. Uh, it depends uh, primarily on how much of the subsurface we want to illuminate or image. And so the surface area is the light green. Uh, what we want to image is uh, 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 below at some, uh, some specific depth. And on the slide, I have the image area is uh, 4.5 kilometers east-west, and, uh, and yes, and four kilometers north-south. Uh, I have to know what the depth of the target, the maximal structural dip, and what sort of lateral resolution uh, we need in order to answer the business questions. Uh, the next slide, determining surface area. Uh, this is a cross-section. In yellow is the desired uh, image area. I have some uh, uh, stratigraphy uh, and there's a fault on the left side of the image area. Some of the things we have to worry about is in the box with uh, black with white letters, uh, dipping layers, increasing depth, increasing dip, and diffractions. So we'll look at these four um, in the next couple of slides. So uh, dipping beds, uh, I'm showing um, on the uh, first dark brown or the shallowest dark brown horizon where I have red, which would be a gas cap and green would be an oil leg. I'm uh, showing a shot right at the edge of the yellow. Uh, if that goes down, it hits that uh, dipping interface. I've tried to draw uh, the angle of incident angle reflection. To capture that energy, I would have to be uh, further to the right where that uh, reddish brown arrow is drawn and the word aperture is displayed. So I need to have uh, hydrophones or geophones that far away from the image area in order to capture that dip. As I uh, clicked to the next one, now increasing depth is shown in yellow in the black text box on the lower right. Um, you can see I've, uh, drawn a zero incident uh, uh, brown line uh, to the fourth layer or so, uh, kind of uh, pale blue to the fifth layer, and then a magenta to the, the, the sixth layer. So as, it go, as I go deeper and deeper and deeper, I need to have more space off of the uh, image area. Uh, that's what we call the aperture. Uh, increasing dip, uh, now I'm showing the deepest layer and I have a couple of uh, zero offset ray paths 
And as the dip is uh, going from shallow near the crest of the anticline to steep on the uh, flank of the anticline, uh, I need more and more aperture as that dip increases. And that's why one of the things the um, uh, interpreter has to tell the acquisition folks, what sort of uh, structural dips are you anticipating? And then uh, the next slide, uh, diffractions. Uh, I have a fault on the left side of the image area, and I've drawn uh, two uh, hyperbola that would be the diffractions. We have to collect enough data so that we capture those diffractions um, out to about a 30 degree angle. And so that's another reason why the surface area has to be larger than the image area. Uh, I'm on the next slide, the impact of aperture. Uh, the first piece of seismic, uh, it shows the desired image area is the full length of the displayed line. No aperture was included, uh, uh, so we replicated what would have happened if we didn't get the extra surface area. And you can see that the imaging on the far left and the far right is uh, very poor, uh, faded out. And then I click and I see seismic on the bottom, and that is where aperture was included. And you can see at the far left, uh, we get much better imaging of the subsurface and what sort of uh, uh, dips there are on the reflectors. And uh, the same thing on the far right, uh, the fuzzy area in the upper section uh, comes into focus as uh, we have uh, expanded the surface area to account for uh, energy that will uh, need to be recorded outside of the uh, image area. Uh, we also have to have uh, longer line lengths in the directions in which we are shooting, uh, and this is to build up fold. And so um, uh, this slide, uh, we have the aperture shown, and then in red, there's the fold buildup area. And so if we're starting the line on the right and moving to the left, uh, it takes a while to get to full fold. And that's what the little diagram at the bottom with uh, purple and white and full and fold on it represents. Uh, if we or have been shooting this, this line left to right, fold drops off as we stop shooting. So again, we need to have enough surface area so that we have the proper aperture and then we also have the proper uh, region for the fold to uh, build up or fall off from fold down to uh, zero fold. Uh, the next slide, what is the proper balance? And so I'm showing here uh, a balance beam and we have money at one end and we have data quality on the other. And uh, the point is that if we spend enough money, we can get excellent data. Uh, if we start taking money bags away and try to save money on acquisition, then our data quality is going to go down. And so the big question is how much should we spend, uh, or let me rephrase that, how, you know, how much should we spend so that we get the adequate data quality so we can answer the business questions? If I make it too cheap of a survey in terms of acquisition and processing, I may not be able to answer the business questions, and then we spent a lot of money without getting the answers that we desire. Uh, of course, the people in accounting, uh, they don't want us to spend more money than we have to, and so that's where balance uh, comes into play. So the next slide says field operations. Uh, it shows in white a base map. This would be my image area, and it has some uh, contours. Uh, those could be two-way travel time or more appropriately depth contours. Uh, the red dashed uh, box uh, rectangle is the area I want to image. And let's say we were going to shoot this uh, uh, kind of a left to right or west to east, east to west. How we do this, uh, think of a Zamboni machine at the uh, ice hockey games. Uh, we would start, uh, let's say at the north end, we'd shoot uh, uh, west to east. A boat would uh, sail down a certain way and then come back uh, east to west. And then it would start shooting uh, west to east 
uh, one uh, uh, swath uh, further to the south, and it would continue and continue and continue until we cover the whole area. So the big uh, problem with marine surveys is that uh, you're pulling streamers that are four or five or six kilometers long, and you have to make a 180 degree turn. It takes some uh, distance and some space and some time in order to turn the boat around and shoot in the opposite direction. And so that's why they uh, uh, use this type of acquisition uh, process. So uh, in summary, I think I have one that talks about acquisition, and that really was from uh, two lectures ago. I think I also have one that talks about uh, processing, and that was from uh, the last session. And then there should be a summary that says survey design. And so uh, to properly image and migrate dipping reflectors, the acquisition layout must be designed to record the data over a large enough area so that we capture the reflections that we need to for our zone of interest at the, its particular uh, range of depths. Uh, this includes recording enough reflection time that the unmigrated image is captured. The dipping reflectors must have sufficient horizontal sampling so that we can properly migrate them back into the right uh, or true subsurface position. If we have uh, areas that have a lot of noise, uh, we have to have the, the design of the survey such that we can attenuate as much as possible that noise and enhance the signal and get uh, the data that we need so that we can run our different noise removal processing steps and still be able to meet our uh, business objectives. So I am on the last slide that says questions. So I will turn uh, the control back to uh, Dr. Fumi and see if we have some questions. Great, thank you, Fred. And thank you to the attendees um, since I've been trying to advance the slides while Fred's talking. Um, so thanks for putting up with the technical errors. Um, if there's any questions, I'd be happy to take them. Um, and yeah. So wait a minute. While we're waiting uh, Thursday, the plan is to do uh, seismic interpretation. I hope my um, uh, cable is repaired and I can uh, do this uh, uh, without uh, needing Danielle to, to uh, toggle the slides, although I'm sure she did a fantastic job. But uh, it just uh, makes it a little easier for me uh, to be able to See what you see and use the uh, pointer uh, to indicate what I'm talking about. Right. Makes it easier for me too, Fred. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We have a question from Nathan Benton who asks, um, do 2D recon surveys always proceed 3D? Also, how do you know the structural and physical characteristics before planning 3D parameters? Very good. Uh, usually, we will have um, some seismic, some 2D seismic data in an area before we would add, or we would uh, 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 contract to have a 3D survey. So, a lot of the information will come from uh, existing 2D data, and it could be fairly sparsely uh, sampled. And so it depends. Uh, things like uh, what's the maximum structural dip? It depends on how well the 2D lines have given a proper structural image of the subsurface and how well the interpreter has uh, interpolated in between the, the uh, 2D lines. Um, uh, in some cases, uh, people will go from a sparse 2D right to a 3D. Uh, in other cases, uh, they may have a sparse 2D. They'll get a denser 2D data set, uh, and then they'll get a 3D data set. So uh, if you're working um, in the Gulf of Mexico and you, uh, uh, and you have a moderately sampled 2D survey, uh, you, you would probably go to 3D survey as the next step. Uh, if you're in a rank frontier area and you just have a very sparse 2D grid, uh, you probably would get a, a denser 2D uh, survey uh, before you acquired 3D data. 
Great. Uh, Shaima asks, um, what is the smallest thickness of bed that we can image with the highest resolution seismic survey? And along with that question asks, um, like when would acquiring higher resolution survey uh, be needed? Okay. Uh, the higher resolution surveys are usually acquired uh, when a field is proven to be economic and they're starting to talk about how are we gonna develop the field? Where should we put a platform? How many wells do we anticipate uh, we need to drill? Uh, so it's not in the exploration phase, it's more in the field development and field production stage. The uh, high-res uh, surveys that have a um, uh, six and a quarter by six and a quarter meter spacing, uh, they will usually have a uh, broader than average bandwidth, and the uh, vertical resolution at the target depths uh, can be on the order of about uh, 15 to 20 meters. Uh, again, it depends on if the target depth is uh, relatively shallow or if it's down at uh, four or five uh, seconds to a travel time. Great. Joanne wanted to hear if there's a difference in planning the inside turns versus the outside turns and which one is preferred. Uh, I don't think there's a I don't think there's a difference in the, the turning except if you're in an area where you have uh, surf and surface currents. So uh, uh, if you are off the east coast of the U.S., as an example, and you have the Gulf Stream, uh, the surface currents can cause problems keeping the, the five or six kilometer uh, streamers positioned where you want. So sometimes if there are strong currents, uh, the preferred orientation for the survey would be parallel to the currents, either shooting in the direction the currents are flowing uh, or turning around and shooting uh, against the current, so to speak. Uh, much better than shooting uh, perpendicular to the currents. Great, thank you. Um, it looks like that's all of the questions that we've had today. Um, so thank you, Fred, for dealing with these circumstances and doing the webinar today. Um, and thank you, everyone, for your attention. And again, thank you for dealing with the technical issues. So um, take care, everyone. Have a good day. Okay, thanks, everyone, for tuning in. All right, bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>